introduction, Garrett, and very well, well, warm welcome to the participants. Uh, my name is Ali Can. Today, I'll be talking about measuring microparticles with light and machine learning. This talk is based on the paper. Let me move. Yes, this paper, uh, which describes a novel particle size analyzer. My personal contribution for this project was through machine learning, so I'll explain both. Uh, we need a background information first, so I'll explain what particles are, uh, where they are used. I'll explain how they are measured uh, commercially. Then I'll move on to explain the setup described in the paper, uh, what is novel about it, and then how machine learning can help uh, for this measurement. With this information, uh, then we can move on to the machine learning model development. I'll explain what were the inputs, outputs. Um, I'll describe the data set. I'll show you the results. Um, after that, I would like to discuss certain details about this machine learning pipeline. And I'll conclude my talk with uh, certain take home messages um, related to a comparison between physics driven models to data driven models and the comparison between applied machine learning to machine machine learning research. So let's start with particles. What are particles? Um, we can find them in nature readily, but we can also produce them. They can be of many different materials. They can be spherical, non-spherical, or even hello, we can put uh, things inside microparticles. They are used in many different industries from cosmetics to pharmaceuticals. Um, now a natural question to ask is, okay, but why do we care about particle size? We care because um, it's an important parameter that affects the um, performance of the product, of the final product. So now let's discuss what is particle size. So for spherical particles, uh, with just one number, right, the diameter, we can describe the whole particle. Um, but as you can imagine, for a group of particles, we don't have one size. We actually have a particle size distribution. In this case, uh, if you would like to describe um, this we, and with one number, right? Um, typically we use D50. Uh, this is the medium value. That is the half of the population is here, half of the population is here. Um, but of course, for the same D50, we can have different distributions, right? It could be narrower, it can be much wider. So to have an idea about the span, of the distribution, we can use D10 and D90 values. So 10% of the population is below this value, 90% of the population is below this value. Um, another important thing here is the y-axis. So we have, we can just count the numbers of particles. We can measure the surface area. We can uh, measure the volume. Typically in laser diffraction particle size analysis, we use uh, the volume basis. So in this talk as well, I'll use uh, D50 based on volume, okay? So now uh, we can talk about how actually we can measure particle size using light. What is the fundamental principle? So when light scatters from a particle, the intensity and the angle depends on the dimension. This principle simply lets us build a particle size analyzer using light. Uh, the underlying physics theory is called Mie scattering theory. Uh, this plot comes from the paper. So here you see uh, at different angles, the scattered intensity for three different particle sizes. So a device using this principle should do two things to measure particle size, right? First, it has to be able to uh, measure the intensity and the angle information. And then it has to transform this information into particle size distribution. 
there are certain assumptions for uh, Mies scattering theory to work. Uh, these are that the particle should be spherical, uh, the, the group should be homogeneous. We should know the refractive index of the medium around the particle and the particle itself. And there is single scattering. That is the scat particle, um, the light scatters only once and it doesn't scatter from another particle, right? So it only scatters once. As long as these uh, assumptions are valid, um, this theory works. So let's actually look at a commercial device. This comes from Oribo's uh, website. They have a schematic of the, uh, their device, uh, a laser diffraction particle size analyzer. So it has two light sources for different particle sizes. And the rest, you see, so the particles are here. The rest measures the intensity at different angles, right? These are photodetectors. So they note there are like 80 plus photodetectors covering a wide range of angles. Um, now the researchers in this paper, the team asked the following question. Can we measure angle intensity information with just one sensor? Uh, you can readily see the implications of this, right? Instead of using 80 plus detectors, can we use just one? Then it will be much smaller and much cheaper, but it's not an easy task. Like how can you capture this information, angle and intensity with just one sensor? So here's what they did. So most of the setup is very similar to the commercial one. Uh, we have the particles here, they flow through the flow cell. So the particles are inside water in this case, they flow here. There is a collimated light beam that hits the particle, light scatters. So everything up to now is just traditional light scattering. And then there is this, sen uh, this filter here. The sensor is behind the filter. The there's just one sensor. So the novelty actually comes from the filter. Let's see what this filter does. Here you sorry, see- uh, Sorry, Alika, quick question sure. from my side. So um, just to make sure that I'm on the same page as you. Sure. So, um, so when you say measuring particles, how big are these particles and, and what makes it so difficult to measure these things? Well, uh, it could be from nanometers to millimeters. So you cannot just use a ruler, right? Um, there are many different ways to measure particles, but um, Light, I mean, using light, the advantage is it's fast. There are methods like, uh, for example, you can use a microscope really to just take a picture and measure them, uh, but it's not as fast. So this is really relevant uh, for industrial applications, as I mentioned, these applications. So you're producing particles, let's say, uh, and you want to characterize them fast. Right, so this gives you a really fast option to see the range. In this particular paper, we focused the size, I will mention, but still, it's from 10 microns to 125 microns. But this, this uh, could be much wider if you want, right? Is that answering yeah, your thank question? You. Thanks, sure. yeah, keep going. So, uh, this is the filter, an actual photograph. So we see that there are holes in the cylinder. Uh, the cylinder length is on the order of centimeters and the diameter of these holes are on the order of hundreds of microns. So the aspect ratio is quite high. Here you see an actual image falling onto the sensor here. And now let's see how this captures this angle and intensity information, right? So now we know what it looks like but let's see how it works. So a light the, with a scattering angle of zero can just pass freely from all these holes, right? But then if it's scattered with an angle other than zero, it should be lower than this angle for it to pass, right? This is the cutoff angle. So if, if the scattering angle is less than this angle, the light will pass, say it's like this, it will be able to pass. If it's larger than this angle, it will hit the wall, right? 
So this is called the cutoff angle of the uh, hole. Within this, there are many holes, you see. So for each of them, depending on their diameter, the cutoff angles are different. So, so far so good, right? Why do we need machine learning? We can capture the angle intensity information. As I explained, we need to do two things for this device to work, uh, but I only explained the first part, right? We, we capture the information, angle and intensity, but now we need to transform this information into particle size distribution. How do we do that? So in a sense, we have this picture. Now we need the particle size information. So uh, the Mies scattering theory, as I explained, uh, it is based on the single scattering approximation. This comes from the paper. Uh, but for this setup, for this filter, for this sensor, we had multiple scattering. So the assumption fails. Uh, that is, since the concentration of the particles are high, the light scatter once and then once more, and then maybe three, four times even, right? So this is why we needed to machine learning to correct this and to get um, the particle size information from this image. So now I can explain the machine learning model development. So this is our setup. We have this image. And from this image, we'll input this to a machine learning model. And we would like to output a particle size prediction, specifically D50 based on volume. Uh, an important question here was, uh, are we going to use concentration here as input? So if we use it, we assume that our uh, model will perform much better. But uh, from a practical point of view, it should work without concentration as input because we don't always know the concentration here, right? Uh, so we said, okay, let's do both and compare. So you'll see both models. Uh, another uh, discussion was to how to correct for the background lightning conditions. So we took a reference image with water only. So without the particles, the rest is the same. So we use this to correct for the background. So in a sense, we input this image as well. Now, an important question here is how do we evaluate the model performance? So the ISO standard says for such a device, uh, if you're measuring spherical particles, your error should be less than 2.5% for your D50 error. Should be less than 2.5%. So this will be our benchmark. This is an important number to keep in mind. Uh, so our metric for this case is mean absolute percentage error. We use this metric so that we can compare with our benchmark. Okay, so let's see the data set. Um, you can imagine that for such a problem, we need many images, right? At different particle sizes and concentrations. So this is how our data set looked like. We measured, as I explained, uh, particle sizes from 10 microns to 120. Uh, we measured these particles at different concentrations, right? Uh, not just one and 10, but in between many concentrations here as well. And per particle size and per concentration, we took five images. So this is how the data set looks like. In total, we had around 450 images. This is not much for machine learning, as you might know, but still a good starting point. These labels here, you see, are obtained by a commercial device, laser diffractive particle size analyzer. Now let's look at the pipelines, right? How does this work? First, I extracted, so I, I find the filter holes. In scikit-learn, you can use the blob finder to uh, find these holes in your images. So this is what I used. Uh, with that, you can actually calculate the intensity, right? It's just the pixel values. 
and then the areas, the areas of the holes, it's using the uh, radius of the holes found. Then, as I explained, I used the water image, only water, to convert these values into percentages. Finally, another future to add is with concentration. So we have 46 here and 47 futures as input, right? Then, the random forest model, the particle size, the D50 value. The second pipeline is almost exactly the same. Only difference is this is without the concentration. So as you can imagine, for this data set, I split into train and test. So let's see the test results. OK. Um, the percentage error here with concentration is 2.5%. And without concentration, it's 5%. So here we are almost there uh, for the ISO standard. Uh, here we are out of spec. Let me explain what this graph is, right? Um, so this is the predictions and these are the labels. So here, imagine that we have for each label, for each particle size, we made multiple predictions, right? We have many images per label. So for one prediction, you can read the predicted value here on the y-axis and the label here. But to show it much better as a summary, I use the mean of these predictions. So this is the mean, and this is the interdecile range. That is the middle 80%. So I did this for all the particle sizes. Here, one, you can notice actually that Almost all of this error is coming from two particles. The rest looks fine. And here as well, it's coming from this, a little bit of this, and this one. So this is something to note. Uh, I'll explain this later. Another thing we wanted to do is how uh, predictions behave with respect to concentration, right? This, these plots alone doesn't give you that information. So this is what we did. We plotted our predictions, these dots, with respect to concentration. So this is the concentration axis. These are the particle sizes. So uh, the label, in a sense, is the straight line. When you change the concentration, your predictions should stay the same. Uh, and we can see that even for the model without concentration as input, it's quite horizontal for almost all except these two, right? These two particles, we see some fluctuation around the correct value. Okay, so this is like an introduction to the pipeline, right? But let's move on. So, sorry, for... Neil, Alika, just maybe just sure. one question that came sure. through. Um, uh, why did you use a random forest? So I think you, you, you said you used a random forest. Why did you choose that? And did you explore other, other options? So actually, from Kaggle, I know that uh, for tabular data, for structure data, uh, random forest variance is all, almost always is the winning algorithm, right? There is gradient boosting, etc., but they are all a family of algorithms. So this was the main reason I picked. So it's not really I tried many algorithms, I did a model selection. No, it's just that. I would, I expect that this would uh, work. Then I actually tried a couple of other models and didn't see a big improvement, right? Uh, so I stuck with it. That's the reason. So for images, I go with ResNet. For structured data, I go with random forests. That's the reason. Thank you. So now we can discuss a little bit of the details. So is this real? This is the most important question. In machine learning, if you see uh, a good performance from your model, whatever it is, the question is, are you fitting the signal or are you fitting the noise? How do you know, right? Because you can get high performance 
uh, by fitting the noise as well. Uh, so we did many tests. Uh, I will explain two of them to show that we are not fitting the noise, uh, hopefully. So if you look at this setup, one thing you might notice that we take five images back to back. So one problem might be if you take these images too fast, uh, maybe they're not really independent from each other, right? So when you do a train test split, actually there is a leakage between your train and test sets. So you get high performance just because these images are too similar to each other. So how do we test for that? So I discussed this with the PhD student, the first author, Rubaya. Uh, she said she used tens of seconds between the images. So that seems good enough, right? Uh, the particles are flowing. So you expect in 10 seconds, a significant change of the distribution. But still, we wanted to test it. So in this image, okay. Can I sure. quickly ask another question from the sure. audience, which might be good to uh, answer uh, uh, already? So, uh, uh, yeah, Carlo was asking, why did you use this loss function exactly? Which loss function? Loss I think, function. I think the, so you didn't specify it, right? But the one from the random forest that you used. Uh, first of all, so for random forest, I didn't specify exactly. Uh, it works. So loss function is mostly used for parametric models. Uh, random forest is a non-parametric model. In this case, I use Gini coefficient to, so maybe I need to explain how random forest works to give answer to this in detail. But basically you split the data set using trees, right? This is how random forest work. Mm -hmm. And the trees, these branches split the data using the Gini impurity concept. So it's not really a loss function. It's, you cannot call it a loss function, but this is how uh, to do the split, basically. Yeah, so what, what I actually think, but uh, I, um, is that maybe Carlo means the MEPI as an evaluation uh, metric. Okay, why MEPI? Simply because to match, so, Loss function and metric are different things, right? Uh, even for a parametric model, loss function is what you optimize. That is what you try to minimize. But the metric can be something different, right? You can use mean square error as a loss function, but accuracy as a metric, because accuracy makes sense to humans. When I, if I give you a loss function number like 0.5, it doesn't mean anything. Is it good or bad? But if I tell you 90% uh, accuracy, then it makes sense, right? So to, to we used the mean absolute percentage error because then we can compare this to the ISO standard. It makes sense. That's the reason. And, and I think also if you didn't use the percentage error, then you get strange results um, uh, given that some particles are smaller than others, right? So you exactly. care more about the percentage error than uh, absolute, uh, mm -hmm. just normal absolute error. Exactly. Yeah. Cool, thanks. Sure. Okay, so let me, let me discuss this again. Are we fitting the noise, right? This is the question. So notice there is a big hole. What is this? Um, so this is actually the light scattering profile right before the filter, right? So here, the light scatters from the particles and then enters the filter, right? So this gives me the intensity right before the filter. So I decided to move these holes here. So if I'm fitting the noise, then I should be able to make predictions using this hole as well. Uh, so the, the results should be like this. Uh, if I'm fitting the noise, the accuracy should be high, right? My error should be low. If I'm not fitting the noise, if I'm fitting the signal, if I'm doing things correctly, then I should see a high error for this case. Uh, and luckily we got this. 
the error was quite high. So that means the effect we are seeing is actually coming from the filter itself, right? For the same images with the light intensity here, I couldn't get good predictions. So it's actually the filter giving me the good results. But this is not still enough. We wanted to do another test. That is, okay, let's do another experiment, collect new data. So this is always very important, right? Doing an external test. Okay, you collect a data set, you split it into two, you have a test set, but always there could be a leakage. So we wanted to do, okay, uh, for just two particle sizes, let's repeat the experiment and see if we can measure. And we can actually, as you can see, our error was 1.7%. So notice here, we also did something different. During the data set collection, it was all like, uh, okay, we pick a particle size, we take measurements, and then we clean the flow cell. In this case, it was more close to the industrial application. That is, we send in the particles of this size, and without cleaning or changing the setup, we send in the second particles. So in this case, still, we were able to measure the particle size. Now, another question is that you might ask you that I was talking about particle size distribution, but I'm predicting B50. What about the span, the D10, right? So we also tried that and we were able to predict D10 and D90 as well. So this is a completely different model, right? A model, a random forest model that can output three values. And we were able to predict more or less uh, these values as well. I want to note one thing here that we didn't emphasize this result. This result is inside the paper, but we didn't emphasize this as much because to be able to sure, I, I mean, if you want to be sure that you're correctly predicting the 10 and the 90, again, you need the following. You need different particle size distributions at the same D50, but different D10 and D90 values so that you're sure you're exactly uh, predicting D10 and D90, not like you are memorizing the difference between D50 and 10s and just predicting this and calculating D10 and D90 from D50, right? We didn't have that kind of particles. It's theoretically less, it's really nice, but in practice, you cannot really control. I want this D50 same, and this D10, this D90. So we didn't have that. And finally, uh, an important point. I mentioned that these look like uh, giving much higher errors than these, right? These particles. So we realized that they are actu these are actually uh, are from different producers, right? These particles are produced from producer A and these are coming from producer B. So maybe there's something to be concerned about. And we, Rubaya took these pictures. You can see non-spherical particles here, right? So when we remove these non-spherical particles, our error actually uh, reduces quite much, right? Below 1% and within the spec, actually, within the ISO standards. But in a question. sense, sure. Again, uh, from Scott, uh, he's a fellow chemist and he's curious about what type of particles these exactly are. Um, well, we did quite a bit of experiments. I mm -hmm. need to check. This is written in the paper. I think they are polystyrene beads, but uh, we need to check what materials. So maybe for the less less uh, chemist people on the line, is this organic or inorganic, a mix? Um, and and how, how small did you go? Uh, I really don't remember the properties in terms of the materials. I think they are polystyrene, but I'm not sure, right? We need to check the paper. Uh, small, you mean uh, the particle size? Yes, if you went below submicron scale. Uh, we have actually now actually so this paper is one year old uh, 
uh, we are working on it still. We are improving and we are working on smaller uh, particles as well, but it's not included in the paper. But the thing is the particle size here is uh, the range we have is fixed by the filter. The filter, its length and the diameter of the holes uh, defines what particle size range you can measure. So with this specific filter, we cannot go below or above. So we changed the sit setup a little so that we can go below this range as well. But that's a future work we did, right? I see, interesting. And then I had another question. Um, it's a back a couple of slides, but you thought it was interesting that you tested on uh, the holes outside the holes, if I can, can explain it like that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it does look like there's still a little bit of a trend, right? Yes. So how, uh, what's the explanation for still seeing a little bit of a trend? Well, actually, by eye, if you look at the images just mm -hmm. here, you can see this because, of course, the intensity before the filter, you can see a change when you change the particle size, when you say change the concentration. So there is some signal. With eye, you can at, at least say, OK, this particle size is quite higher than that particle size, right? Maybe then you cannot predict exactly what the particle size is, but you can predict the trend just by looking at the intensity here. Yeah, so basically if there's bigger particles inside the fluid, then the light is scattering. So um, uh, even if you're not looking at the holes, there's still more light lost if the uh, particles are bigger. So the part when the part when we have larger particles, uh, light scatters less. So the relationship uh, yes. is this. So yeah. uh, light hits the particle. So if it's large, the angle is low. If it's small, the angle is high. So this is the basic uh, relationship. Uh, and depending also on the concentration, you can really see the change when you just move from image to image fast you can see the change. So as a human, we can make predictions without any calculation, just by looking at the images, we can learn the relationships, but our accuracy will be low. This is what we are seeing, basically. Yeah. So I was here, actually, um, this, is, this is it um, about the details. And if you don't have any questions, I'll move on to the take home messages. Okay. Sure, go ahead. So here I'll discuss the physics driven model to data. And then uh, I'll compare applied machine learning to uh, machine learning research. This comes from a blog post I've written. You can read it here in detail, but to be able to make this comparison, first we need to understand models, right? I really like the saying, uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Understanding this is fundamental. So models are a simplification of reality, right? It's a simplification at the cost of accuracy. One model is not better than the other inherently. You cannot say such a thing, sphere is better than flat earth. It depends on the application. So if you are going to the supermarket, this model is not better than flat earth, right? For our day-to-day -day activities, we are actually considering the earth to be flat. But of course, uh, for a much complex uh, project, like launching a satellite, you should be as accurate as it is, right? Then you can afford the complexity. So this is very important to understand. And in this case, for the particle size analysis, this is what we had. This is the spec. We had the Mies scattering model. It was not accurate enough due to multiple scattering. In the literature, there are actually um, models that correct for multiple scattering, but the problem is they are too complex, like iterative models that needs to do fitting. So it takes time really to fit these models and it's not really suitable for an online industrial application, 
right? The particles are flowing. You want to monitor the particle size almost real time. So with machine learning, we were able to do this, right? Move into spec. This was the advantage of machine learning. But it doesn't mean it's like machine learning is always advantages with respect to physics. Of course not. Notice that the signal was in the data thanks to the physics knowledge, right? The filter design was guided by near theory. So without that knowledge, without that design, machine learning cannot work just by looking at the scattered intensity without the filter. The other thing is, causation versus correlation. With its current form, we can only discover correlations with machine learning. Physics is the way that provides the causation, that helps us explain things. Then another problem with machine learning is generalization, right? Okay, for this setup, for these particles, it, wor it works. But if, want, if you want to generalize to a different lab, different particles, then we need data from those situations, right? So generalization power of physics is much better. So the best thing is actually to combine them. In a sense, in this project, we combined them. We implicitly guided our model, in a sense, using physics knowledge. But you can also explicitly do that. Uh, there is something called physics guided neural networks. In this case, what they are doing was uh, into the loss function, they put a physical law. So they punish uh, physically inconsistent results, right? Explicitly forcing the neural network to learn physically consistent uh, results. Uh, I also wrote about this in the blog post, um, explained how they work. So you can read if you're interested. And the other message here is machine learning research, if you're familiar with it, assumes fixed benchmark data sets and focuses on architecture and optimization. But applied machine learning is about data collection and domain knowledge. So in this talk, even in this talk, you saw that I didn't talk much about the architecture, how I, I trained the param hyperparameters. I focused mostly on the data, data collection, explanation. If you do this, if you do that, right? Um, and even for machine learning research, I think this is very important because for, for popular data sets like ImageNet, this is the most popular benchmark data set, it has its own problems, it has its biases. So if you are interested, you can uh, read this paper here, ObjectNet, to see the problems with ImageNet. So I think also for research, uh, data sets are important. With that, I conclude my talk. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And now we can have some questions. Thank you.